Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Dr. Brian Mills, Assistant Professor at the University of Florida. We talk about Brian's research interests in sport economics, particularly in the labor market for umpires and players. Brian also shares with us how improvements in technology has changed the game in baseball, where umpires have called for more strikes. Brian also mentions his free new course called Exploring Pitch Data with OR over at datacomp.com and explains what OR is and how this open source statistical program can be used to analyze your data. Check out the show notes for all the links, resources and books mentioned by Brian at economicrockstar.com forward slash Brian Mills. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. So if umpires are changing their behavior in certain ways, uh, while the labor market in sports tends to be zero sum, it may be at the advantage of some players rather than others. And in that case, we can think about, well, what are these externalities or ancillary impacts of uh, enforcement of rules for umpires and should the players union uh, be involved in that sort of enforcement if it's going to change the way that players are paid in, in that labor market. R has a, a broader base of, of people contributing to it. Uh, I think the, the fewest are actually economists, but uh, there's a lot of statisticians that provide their time to creating packages. And in terms of new techniques, uh, I always find them first available in R. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I am so honored to have Professor Brian Mills join me today. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Brian Mills is an assistant professor at University of Florida within the Department of Tourism, Recreation and Sport Management, specializing in managerial sports economics. Professor Mills is also associate research faculty within the Eric Friedheim Tourism Institute. Brian's research interests encompass topics such as the sports labor market, industrial organization, and sports league policy, public policy and economic development related to sport, and advanced analytics in a sports business. He is especially interested in applying economic lessons and quantitative analysis to problems that sport managers face in everyday decision making. Dr. Mills has also worked on consulting projects for professional sports teams and municipalities both in the U.S. and Canada. Before arriving at Florida, Brian received his PhD and MA in sport management from the University of Michigan. During that time, he also completed MA degrees in statistics and in applied economics. Brian earned his BA in psychology in 2006 from St. Mary's College of Maryland, where he played NCAA Division III baseball. Brian's work and research interests can be found at brianmmills.com and at princeofslides.blogspot. Brian is now offering a new course called Exploring Pitch Data with OR over at datacamp.com. Brian, I'd love to go back to your recent history in terms of your education, if you don't mind. And I noticed that you've gone from psychology to statistics to economics. And I want to know, and that seems to be such a perfect fit and something that, to me, you were somebody that knows what you were getting yourself into in terms of eventually sports economics or sports management? Yeah, so my um, I, I remember my undergraduate application essay was I, I want to be the general manager of a professional sports team someday. And, and I, I veered away from that a little bit. And so my undergraduate major was in psychology. I had started as a math major uh, as a 19-year-old, wasn't quite disciplined enough to sit there and do um, math problems every single night for homework. Uh, so once I got to graduate school, I said, I'm going to sit down and, and really learn this stuff that I, I really enjoy doing. I, I got a lot of experience uh, doing research as an undergraduate, and it got me interested in research methods in statistics. And my uh, graduate advisor was an economist uh, at the University of Michigan, Rod Fort. So uh, that got me into the economics area. And so as a psychology major doing a sport management degree, I wanted to make sure I was grounded in those quantitative disciplines in which I was going to do research in the future. And how was that to bring all that in, especially such a trying and testing time as well, when the workload was quite astonishing to do something in statistics as well? I, I did my, my master's in sport management standalone. Yeah, yeah. And during my PhD, uh, there was a lot of classes taken outside of my department. So there was some 
efficiency taking place uh, in terms of being able to share credits and the way that Michigan structures its uh, enrollment, uh, I was able to take a lot of different classes um, while I was taking classes different semesters there. So it was a lot of coursework. Uh, I don't think it's quite as much as it might seem when people first see the, the number of degrees, but I enjoyed it. It, it was a lot of fun to go to these classes and think about the problems that I was interested in, particularly sports problems that most of us that are interested in sports find fun. Uh, and it made those classes a little more enjoyable, a little easier to sit down and start applying those things that I was learning to uh, sports problems. And you as a baseball player as well, when you played for the NCAA Division Three, and to have that background, educational background as well, you have a unique insight into perhaps how we could apply ec economics or sports management into the academic research. What to you would have been one of the most standout pieces of findings that you have recently come across or even an interest that you wanted to explore in terms of relating, say, even baseball to economics or sports management? Right. So a lot of my more recent work, you mentioned the umpires, uh, is kind of inspired by Larry Kahn's paper, uh, I believe in 2000, and using the, the sports arena as a labor market context for larger problems in labor economics. So what I've been looking at is while people tend to look at on-field performance, my research is focused on umpires. It's actually a very unique labor market, uh, these officials in Major League Baseball in particular. And what I've found is that when they're given the incentives and they're monitored and they're able to get feedback and training on the things that they do, very easily measurable performance, uh, they've improved their performance and changed their behavior in ways that uh, the league expects them to. Uh, and that has actually had a big impact on the league itself. So some of the things that I really like to do coming from that, that research, which, which I found interesting, is to understand how that has heterogeneous impacts on the player's labor market. So if umpires are changing their behavior in certain ways, uh, while the labor market in sports tends to be zero sum, it may be at the advantage of some players rather than others. And in that case, we can think about, well, what are these externalities or ancillary impacts of uh, enforcement of rules for umpires? And should the players union uh, be involved in that sort of enforcement if it's going to change the way that players are paid in, in that labor market? So let's, if you don't mind, talk briefly about the labor market and how it differs for umpires and for the players. And what do you mean by the training and the incentives that the umpires get and how that impacts on the players' labor markets. What's, what do you mean by that? So the, the umpires' labor market is very unique. Once you're at the major league, the highest level, um, you essentially have a tenure, like, like at a university. And before that, there's a very long training process, up to 10 years at the minor league levels, paid very little money. Uh, but once you get up to the top level, there is a lot of stability. And what the league saw was that umpires – weren't really interested in doing what the league told them to because uh, in a lot of cases they had uh, some security there. There's a number of, this was in the 1990s, and there was a number of disputes between 1990 and 2001 that maybe made the umpires a little less sure that they were going to be able to keep their jobs. And most recently in 2001, and then again in 2009, there was new technology introduced to the umpires. And what it does is it tracks their ball strike calls. So if you're familiar with baseball, over the plate, call it a strike, way outside, really high, call, call those pitches balls. And it tracks the ball and it tracks the call made by the umpire. So we can say, is this a correct or an incorrect call? And once it was very clear that they were being measured on those things, uh, they were getting the feedback, they get a report on that data every single day. So they're able to integrate the data into their um, into their development as umpires. Uh, we saw them improve their accuracy over that time. A lot of that accuracy came at the bottom of the strike zone, down near the knees, and that tends to be a place where it's very difficult to hit balls. Uh, so if they're calling a lot more strikes down low, pitchers responded to those incentives. They threw the ball low more often, and overall offense in the league decreased pretty substantially over a uh, five to 10 year period. So as you can imagine, if certain players are better at hitting balls that are low than other players, it's going to hurt those players less than the players that are not very good at hitting those low baseballs. And so the next step in this research is to understand, well, we know offense decreased. Did offensive output for different types of players that have different skill sets in terms of hitting those low pitches change their performance differently across the, the pool of players? Just to 
mention about the new technologies that were put in place there, that obviously reduced human error and we know the significance that technology has and we see we see that in other sports as well, especially in, in soccer or football. But it has an unintended consequence in that in, in regards to the baseball that you mentioned, players begin to realise then that if there's if you're hitting below the knee, chances are there's going to be more strikeouts. Is this something that has benefited the defense or the offense and has tactical st- or strategic changes taken place by management? Uh, yes, I, I think to all those questions. So we, we've seen strikeouts continue to increase. Uh, as the strike zone expanded, we saw walks decrease. Uh, and and the, the most interesting thing to me in, in going back to, to when I actually played baseball, and the biggest part of the game is that strategic interaction between the pitcher and the batter and, and trying to get that batter out. And in as you know, in economics, strategic interactions, it's a big area, a very interesting area to, to research. So when we see umpires move where they're calling balls and strikes, we actually tend to see pitchers throw p- more pitches to those areas. And as a response, uh, because the players know that they're going to get more pitches there, because they know that the umpires are more likely to call those strikes, they're more likely to swing at those different pitches as well. So this strategic interaction has taken place. There's a lot of changes in those directions that I just mentioned since we saw these changes in the strike zone. And the overall output of offense has gone down. So pitchers have allowed much fewer runs. And there's been a bit of a change. I don't know that this was induced necessarily by the umpires, uh, but there's been a bit of a change in the strategy that batters take at the plate. So with a lot of the analytics that are going on in the sport, Uh, There seems to be a bigger focus of hitting the ball in the air, trying to hit home runs rather than rounding out, which, of course, can work against trying to hit pitches very low, which are much easier to hit on the ground. uh, uh, Curiosity regarding the labor market there, would you have looked at, say, the correlation with wages and how perhaps the batter's wages might have increased, but on a smaller rate compared to maybe the pitcher's? Yeah, so I haven't looked at that yet. That's part of this uh, thinking about the heterogeneous effects in the labor market. My inclination is that it wouldn't necessarily give more money to the pitchers. Since it's a zero-sum game, ultimately, while pitchers are letting in fewer runs, they're not necessarily that much better than another pitcher because that other pitcher is also letting in fewer runs. So I don't know that it would shift more money to pitching. Now, certainly that could have happened for some other reason. Uh, But I think if, again, if, if... the changes the umpires are making, the strategic changes the pitchers making are making is working more toward the strengths of certain players rather than others, then we might see changes in that um, in the amount that certain players are paid and certainly the union, the players union would be interested in, in getting involved in that. I'd love to know, based on your BA in psychology, how it kind of relates to the economics that you've been exposed to? Because a lot of people are saying, and and it's true, especially with the new movement in terms of behavioral economics, and you probably saw all this happening or evolving quite early because you were a a Mm -hmm. graduate of psychology. Yeah, so I think I I really like the the area of behavioral economics. I'm working on some experiments with some co-authors at the University of Illinois um, on some behavioral economics projects. And And I think having that background in psychology as an undergrad graduate, being able to do some research in that area allowed me to understand where surveys can be useful. I know a lot of economists tend to be a little off off put by surveys, but understanding where that data can come from, uh, how to properly collect that data and collect it in a way that's going to be valuable uh, in the economic sense uh, to run these types of experiments to evaluate people's behavior. I mean, psychology, it's about behavior. Mm -hmm. Economics, I think of economics as being about behavior as well. Uh, A lot of people see it as money and finance. Uh, That's not really how I view it. I think money and finance is kind of a means to an end to understand the behavior. And do you see any kind of common crossover between the two or what might stand out to you when you maybe saw that first crossover happening? What was that one particular trigger that might have happened? For me in particular, uh, I had a lot of interest in education. Uh, so the psychology of motivation and education, as well as motivation in athletics, as a as a college athlete, you're you're fighting a lot of different identities in terms of 
having to participate in sports, having to participate in education. And there's a lot of crossovers there here in the U.S. You know, there is a huge, huge market for college sports, not so much the level I played, but but the students we have here at Florida, uh, many of them great students are practicing 40, 60 hours a week uh, on top of going to, to class. So that was the, the main driver, the main interest that I had as you know, an undergraduate originally applying to graduate school. From the economic standpoint, it's a similar type of problem, right? While we don't necessarily think about uh, motivation and measuring identities, uh, we do think about allocating time to certain things. Uh, We do think about uh, how education plays into this larger market for college sports. Uh, There's a lot of uh, discussion about whether college sports should be so large and affiliated with high-level research universities, and it's an important discussion to have. Uh, but they have huge values to education, to our university here at Florida. You go anywhere with a, a Gator shirt on and somebody says, go Gators to you. And that's, that has value of some sort, right? So there's that psychological connection. And there's also that, that value that we might be able to measure and, and evaluate. Well, what does that do for us as a university? What does it do for the student when they go out there in the job market? I'd love to talk to you about your exploring pitch data but, or something that you released on data, datacamp.com. Mm-hmm. And that really piqued my interest when you put that tweet out there. And I signed up and I, I got to start with it, but I'm not proficient in R at all. So it seems very much like there's a lot of coding involved. But again, it's something that people who were working with or are able to analyze the variables and work through them. But for those people that aren't certain or understand what OR is, could you briefly explain what OR is and then your motivations for using this type of coursework? And I'd like to say that it's actually free. You provide a free and I'll put the link on the show notes page too. Yeah, so R is an open source programming language. It's very much a statistical language. It's used to do everything from calculate means and t-tests and p-values. It's a very complex machine learning regression analysis, Bayesian regression analysis, uh, multi-level models, pretty much anything you can think of. So a lot of the statistical packages that we've all been uh, accustomed to, Stata, SPSS, SAS, a lot of them have limitations in the way that data is addressed. So if you open up Stata, it's very much built by economists, right? R has a a broader base of of people contributing to it. Uh, I think the, the fewest are actually economists, but Uh, There's a lot of statisticians that provide their time to creating packages. And in terms of new techniques, uh, I always find them first available in R. So anything from non-parametric regression, uh, generalized additive models, things like that, we can do in R that we might not be able to do and implement as quickly or as soon as we do in Stata or SPSS. Uh, The fact that R is free is, of course, a huge benefit to it. Uh, You can download it on your laptop and start going to town. And there's a lot of help online. So you can Google, how do I code logistic regression in R? And you can go to Stack Overflow or these other sites that you can kind of move along on your own. So my introduction to R came uh, my first year in graduate school. And so I've been working with it almost 10 years now. And it's, it's a steep learning curve, particularly if you have not programmed before or if you're not familiar with statistics prior to working in it. But one of the great things that I found with with DataCamp when I started working with them is you can start very, very base level, and it's automatically checked, uh, the work that you do. It gives you problems to code, try to, you know, take the averages and all of these groups for some variable. Uh, And it walks you very slowly through those, and it it helps get you up that steep learning curve in R. And so when they contacted me, I jumped at the chance to be able to be a part of that as well as be a part of that in the context that I learned R and that was sitting down with data that I thought was really fun to deal with baseball data and, and provide a class on that. So, so the course is, I hope a lot of fun and it's a lot of basic data manipulation, summarization, some visualization of pitching data, this data that's actually used uh, in my umpire work where they monitor umpires and give them uh, feedback on the measurement of their performance. So it's actually that data that's being used in that course. And the visuals are fantastic because I also saw one of your websites, Prince of Slides.blogspot. I don't think you're working on that at the moment. Or you transferred all the data over to your current one. But the, the visualizations that you have after running some of the data through or are amazing. 
something you wouldn't even get in SPSS or Stata. Yeah, so there there's some great possibilities in R in visualization, even in the, the base package of R. Uh, there's lots of add-on packages. Again, they're all free uh, that allow you to do very professional level visualizations. Uh, ggplot2 uh, is a great package to develop some visuals. There's color schemes that you can highly customize. Uh, and that customization is something that I really value in building visualizations. Uh, Stata, it can build some very nice visualizations, but there's some walls that I've run into there. And, and certainly R, I think, is, is at the top of the class for, for creating these visuals uh, on a, a wide variety of things. And even your course that you provide on Data Camp, exploring pitch data about R, what's great is that it gives that behavioral incentive to complete the next course because you offer, I think they're called XPs or points, 100 XP or 50 XP. And each slide, each video is quite short and not intense, but short to the point and allows you to digest that and move on to the next part. And you can trade 30 XP of your 100 for a helpful hint in order to get you over the line, in order to get onto the next stage. And I think that's fantastic. I think it's something that Dan Ariely actually integrated into his own website to help you explore his website. So he offers you some points and see, do you get onto the next page? And, you know, it's, it's a fantastic way to help you become incentivized in order to complete or work yourself through the course. Not, some people mightn't uh, care about that, but I, I think it uh, it's almost has a, it's not a monetary value, but it's something similar. Yeah, I, I explicitly asked them about that because before I started, you know, developing a course, I wanted to see what it was all about and go through it. And I noticed that they were keeping those XP points, and, and certainly they're they're gamifying the the experience in, in a lot of ways. As you said, there there's some penalties if you take hints or ask for the solution, and and so one of the things that they've done is they've actually created groups. So I think they have. My understanding is they'll have businesses that need to train some workforce on some basics in R so they can grab some data. And, and these people that are in their group together, they can try to see who can get the most most points within their group and, and get through all these exercises. Uh, I think it's a great way to do it. You know, I was a big, um, big into video games growing up and having that next level and being able to gain those sorts of things uh, really always spoke to me in, in playing those. And I think it's it's probably underused in education, but it's certainly, I think, been studied before in terms of, you know, gold stars and tokens and things like that uh, in the educational context. And I think they're really taking advantage of that, which is fun. And it's only when the technology improves and we don't know what's going to be out there in the future. But a lot of adolescents and younger people and old adults as well, they're, they're, they enjoy this escapism through games. And if we can, in a way, integrate this into education, I think it's a win-win situation for all. I, I don't know how it could be done. Maybe it'd be best at maths or something like that, where you uh, have problems that you work out. And if you could hide those problems and make it as a fun, interactive way to complete it, then why not? It's like that Pokemon Go game where you get the people out there and become somewhat active and explore the, your surroundings. Right, yeah. And, and I, I don't think it's necessarily a, a brand new idea, but as you said, just as the technology develops, it's much easier to implement them. So I remember in elementary school playing a game called Number Munchers, uh, where we would have to find the fractions, and it was a, a game. And so I think those sorts of things can certainly be successful. In the college context, I think we're all still trying to figure out what is the best way uh, to do that for our students, and particularly our online students as, as education expands online. I think there's a lot of questions and, and obstacles that we're, we're all still trying to figure out with some trial and error. And staying with technology, you had a paper there with Peters and Sung, Soccer Technology Coach Migration and Success in International Soccer. I'd love to find out what the main, I suppose, abstract or the theme around this paper is and what your findings were, if you don't mind. No, no. Um, so this is very much Thomas Peters, who is at Erasmus University. Thomas is from Belgium, uh, working in, in the, the Netherlands. Um, and, and so essentially what we're trying to evaluate there is what leads to soccer success uh, at the national level. Uh, so we can think about all the, the economic variables that lead to being successful in soccer. Uh, you have more money, you have more leisure time, uh, you have more people, you're probably going to be better at soccer than nations that don't have any of those things. And, and so 
Thomas is in an economics department and he's, he's interested in how migration of coaches, they might carry over some of that technology, some of that knowledge. Uh, so it's really about knowledge transfer to other countries as, as coaches move. Uh, there's a little bit of work in this. I think we're trying to expand it uh, in this two-stage model of thinking about what's the technology and how does it transfer. Uh, and at this point, we don't have a whole lot of findings, uh, largely because it's in the, the beginning stages. It's been a long project. The data is enormous. Uh, so my graduate student has been sitting there hand collecting coach information. And so the next step is now to evaluate, does this knowledge transfer over to countries when coaches move? Uh, but as, as of now, the things that you would expect leading to soccer success seem to be pretty evident. Uh, so higher GDP, more population, more more soccer being played in that area uh, tends to be mean better soccer teams. And where do you start when you come to source data like this? Because I, I was going to say when you talk about coaches, the observations will be relatively small. But then you said there's a huge data set there that you have to get. And is this data that's already made available or are you, you know, online or where, where would you source it? So that, that's the challenge. One of, one of the great things about working with sports data is all of these questions that we have about labor markets and migration. Uh, we have lots of data on sports. We have lots of data on outcomes, on players, on coaches. And so a lot of it is out there. We can find it in databases people provide for free online. Uh, some of it I've had to purchase. Uh, but the biggest step in this project is actually merging all of this information together. So we've found all of the information on population, GDP, income for countries at one website. Uh, we've found game outcomes, national game outcomes on another website. We grab our ELO scores for sort of rankings of the teams on a website that generates those for us. And then my graduate student, his his big role has been actually to go through by hand, Wikipedia, um, national team pages, Googling whatever he can find to figure out where the coaches, excuse me, where the coaches are from, um, what years they coached each team, uh, which games maybe they didn't coach for whatever reason, and trying to integrate that all into that data. So we have data back through on, on soccer outcomes back through the early 1900s. Uh, and we can use that to try to build a, a model of, well, how does the macro economy change and how does that lead to soccer success uh, over time more recently and then apply that in the context of these um, of these coaches and how they have impacts? I, I'm just startled because you obviously have the research questions that you need to write up. But, you know, to ask a question like this, I, I don't know, if, because there's there's no theory out there to support this. And as such, but you have to build theory around your technology or I don't know where you'd even get theory on coach migration, for example. And I think these sorts of projects, you know, it's interesting and fun to evaluate, well, what happens with soccer? But I think there's larger economic theories about, well, um, allowing migration allows the transfer of knowledge and technology from one, one country to another. And so the idea is that we can provide some broader uh, context and broader generalizations of understanding, well, Here's a context where we have knowledge and technology transfer taking place. This may mean it's happening in other areas that, of course, have a much larger impact on the economy as a whole. Certainly soccer is only so so large, but there's lots of other industries where we could imagine this sort of thing happening uh, through migration. If you were happy to move on from the sports, the umpires and that type of thing, I'd love to be able to talk about some of your your roadmap to research and you're uh, publishing like a pro. Like These are some kind of questions that mm -hmm. I became interested in asking only quite recently and I regret not asking the academics beforehand, like your writing tips or your, your schedule and that type of thing. And I just, these papers just jumped on and goes, these are perfect to discuss. I, I'm happy to go whatever direction you'd like. You know, the, those, I, I think the ones you're, you're grabbing off there, uh, they were talks to our graduate students here in our department and, and trying to help them understand publishing. I think a lot of times uh, we don't communicate very well to our graduate students about you know, what it takes to put a paper together and, and how often we fail. Uh, so I always share with them, thanks to some, some recent acceptances, I'm still well below 40% acceptance rate at journals. Uh, and I think we, we see that as, as a success. So it's usually in those sorts of things, what I, what I share is having some fortitude to, to push through 
reviewer comments and things like that. Uh, my biggest one is taking a step back when you do receive those referee comments and and giving it a day or two to soak in. Uh, whenever we first get them, we, we want to call that reviewer to uh, an idiot and, and tell them they don't know what they're talking about. But when it comes down to it, it's about communication. And, you know, as an educator, as someone who tries to be active in, in communicating to the general public about the things that I do, I think we have to understand that writing and publishing is about communicating as well. And, and usually referee comments, 90% of them, when I deal with them, uh, I didn't communicate it well enough uh, for them to understand what I was talking about. And I recall when I submitted a, a paper in to a journalist, my first paper was actually my master's thesis that I condensed into an academic paper. And I submitted it into a, a, a journal. And like that, I got um, a feedback where they made recommendations. Because I never spoke to anyone about it to you know find out what the process is. And what I did was I just put it in the drawer and forgot about it. And I just left it. Yeah, yeah. And, but then when I went to go back to it, it was like I missed out on four years and I'd have to update the data. And I just said, <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, it's, it's I think it's still in the drawer. I have one of those papers. And every every time I talk to my co-author on it, we're like, yeah, we should we should do that again. But I have the same problem. You, you go back to that and we're going to have to add three more years worth of data, which is a bunch of uh, extra data collection. And, and yeah, I mean, my, my experience, my first experience sending to – an academic journal, uh, it needed some more work. And, and the comment that we got from one reviewer was clearly the authors don't understand even the basics of economics 101. <laughs> and so he was right. We said some dumb things in that paper and, and, and that happens. Uh, so again, taking that as, well, we did not communicate this well uh, is, is about as, as good as it could go. And do you have any writing tips for our listeners, whether they're academics or graduates or undergrads? My, my tip is, to get better is simply read and write. Um, you know, as a faculty member, this is something I struggle with in, in giving feedback to, to students on their writing. Uh, of course, it's easier for me to just rewrite it. So it's a, it's a real challenge for me. But I think the, the only way to really understand where your writing isn't reaching other people is to continue reading other people's work and continue writing yourself uh, and it will get better. That's one of the reasons I had a blog in graduate school. Uh, besides being kind of bored at the slow progress of academic work, uh, it allowed me to just practice writing and communicating to other people. And I think it really helped me be able to, to start writing for academic work as well, even though it's less formal just putting sentences and thoughts together in, in a coherent way. It was very helpful to know that it was going to be out there for the public. Uh, it was a lot of pressure. That's very accountable. And I had a guest on recently, Cameron Murray, he's from Australia. And that's something he did when he was an undergrad as well. He just put his writings up and allowed him to reach goals and deadlines when it came to his research. Mm -hmm. And he kept on top of things and became accountable by putting it out there. And I suppose you have what Taleb would say, skin in the game. And if you don't live, you know, put up qual top quality stuff, or even if it's a small post, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's almost you're. If if you have followers there, you're letting them down. You need to keep that up. Right, right, and and I go back to my early posts at that site, and and I cringe at a few of them sometimes, but you know, it was a way to work through and, and get better at, at the communication. So I would always encourage people to just write and read as much as they can, particularly. Uh, in economics, where economists in journals tend to have a very specific way of, of writing, um, very straightforward to the point, explicit about each sentence and each point that they make. And, and that's something we all struggle with. So the more we read it, the better we're going to get at it. When you have your paper moving or your, you had a presentation moving from research idea to research agenda, how to develop your research roadmap as a graduate student. Again, I suppose that's similar to the writing tips you've given, I'm sure. But Based on that roadmap, are you, t are you talking about idea generation to completion and how would that work? Yeah, so idea generation wise, I think that really arises out of the reading. Um, so reading papers and understanding where there's gaps. Uh, that, that's how I learned um, from my advisor to, to start doing that. So part of my qualifying as a PhD student, qualifying exams was basically reading the entirety of the history of, of sports economics, so all the foundational papers back to Rottenberg, uh, and, and putting those together in a coherent way almost as a giant review of sports economics. 
And I think those sorts of strategies really help you identify where people tended to uh, focus and where they may have missed that focus. In terms of going from, from an idea to a paper, I think having a good story um, about why you're doing what you're doing uh, is really important to keep you focused on the problems that you want to solve. So if you start from a data set and you say, what's all the great stuff I can do from this data? I, I've done it. And, and you end up kind of all over the place in terms of your, your focus. Uh, so, you know, with my more recent work on umpires, uh, I was particularly interested in first uh, thinking about labor markets and incentives in the labor market and bias in the labor market. And that led me to understanding, well, okay, we have these biases in the labor market. Now monitoring and evaluation should impact those, um, lo that low performance or those biases. So then I looked at this and, and now we know that performance is changing. Well, clearly an extension from that is, well, what are the external effects? And those are the sorts of things I'm working on now. Uh, in building up that sort of, of chain and that story that you can tell about the, the research that you're doing, Having that story just leads right to that next idea. That's that's my experience. From it. And that's a, a fantastic idea where you looked at labor markets in general and then became very specific with your research on study of umpires. And I, I notice, if you don't mind, a picture or a card behind you with the a, a Boston Red Sox. Is that a coach? Is it? Uh, let's see. Ah, that is from a Saber Seminar uh, up there. Uh, but yeah, that is a, uh, I believe it's a player. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, back in the back in the day, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very old picture. Uh, but this was uh, I presented some of my umpire work in Boston uh, at a at a conference called Saber Seminar. It was a charity conference with lots of professionals from the industry and things like that, which was a, a fun change up from academic conferences. That type of thing, what you're saying there, it's a change from academic conference. It's it's something I notice is happening a lot lately when it comes to putting economics out there to the public to make it more accessible. They're becoming like festivals or comedy and they're integrating all of this into the team of economics in order to get people more interested in it and to get the academic work out there. How was the, how did they receive your work on saber metrics and baseball data? Oh, uh, so that it was well received. I had a lot of fun. So I, I think, you know, one thing to, to communicate about economics is, again, and this is how I always start, particularly the, the more general talks that are in an academic conference, is to, to talk about it as human behavior. So my discussion was looking at changes that have happened this year. There's been some additional changes um, in umpires and looking at, well, what are the strategic changes that batters and pitchers make? And we see, as I was talking about before, we see pitchers following the strike zone with where they throw the ball. We see batters swinging in those areas more often. And so coming up with a story that is, is generally interesting to the baseball fan who cares about strategic interaction in baseball, uh, but using economics as a guiding principle to understand uh, incentives and, and what's driving that behavior, uh, what are the rewards and goals of, of that behavior. I think it melds well with, with the way people uh, like to think about the world. Now, certainly we have behavioral economics and there's lots of, of exceptions to those rules. Uh, but I like to, to use economics as a tool to give us a really nice starting point. Here's what we would expect to happen if everyone was perfectly rational. And here's what seems to happen when these different things change about those. And I think I think that's interesting generally to a lot of people. We, we know that Freakonomics was wildly popular. One of the reasons is I think they were able to communicate that sort of story. What are the strange things that, that happen uh, and how can we use economics as a framework to understand them and then understand where things may have gone wrong? Brian, if you could step into the DeLorean and time travel to any era, what time period would you go back to? Who would you like to meet and what would you say or converse with them over? Uh, so I'm a sports fan, uh, so it's going to be about sports. I'm going to be less academic here. What I would really like to do is, is time travel back to maybe the, the earlier 1900s and to understand how hard pitchers threw at that, time, at that point in time. Uh, there's a lot of arguments about athletic prowess. It's, this especially happened in baseball. Athletic prowess in the early 1900s versus now. Were they throwing as hard as they are now? We have pitchers throwing 105 miles an hour. And 
we just don't really have a good answer for that. And so being able to go back and, and talk to those people, what they saw, how they saw it, and stand up there and, and see how fast pitches are being thrown, I think it would tell us a lot about the evolution of athletes over that time, which, which I would enjoy to know more about. I wonder if there's any television footage that you could trace the speed of a ball. I know the what you call the slides per second will be different, so there's a bit of a skipping and that type of thing. But taking, I'm sure there's some algorithms that, that could take that into account and measure the speed. So some physicists have worked on this. There's actually a, a documentary. I forget what it was called. It might just be called Fastball. Uh, that looked at some of these over time. Uh, and the conclusion seemed to be that in terms of peak maximum velocity that somebody could throw hasn't increased very much in the past 100 years. I find that extremely hard to believe given the improvements we've seen in athletes uh, over that time. Uh, they used some, some NASA technology to measure velocity and things like that back, I think, in the 50s. So I'm skeptical, and, and that's why I, I need the DeLorean uh, to go back in time and do that, uh, largely because I'm skeptical. You're a consultant as well, and so you, you use some tracking system, or there's one, I think it's Trackball or something like that. that Trackman? Trackman, that's it. Yeah. Is that only specific for like baseball, or could you put it to any game? Because we have a game here in Ireland called Hurling. I don't know if you're aware of it. I, I was in Dublin last year, and I saw some commercials for it. It looked pretty wild. Yeah, and I think helmets were only compulsory wearing of late. And um, yeah, you, you have a stick for anybody who doesn't want to, who wants to know more about it. Just Google hurling, and mm -hmm. you'll see the game. But I'm wondering, could something like that be applied to that type of sport? I think it could. So baseball has been at the forefront of this, but I know other sports are using it. The TrackMan actually originated in golf uh, to track golf balls. Uh, so that's a Doppler radar system, and that's essentially now what. Uh, the league is using to evaluate their umpires, but they're also using it to evaluate the angle of the ball off the bat, the velocity of the ball when the, when the batter hits it. And I'm sure it could be used to uh, evaluate the, the speed of, of balls in all kinds of, of sports. I'm not a physicist. Physicists would be very helpful with that, uh, but I suspect it would be pretty straightforward. You know, they're, they're measuring a lot of different things down on the field and they've paired it with some other technology that tracks the players and the umpires themselves tracks the pitchers, the release point, just about anything you could think of. Uh, they're still trying to figure out what to do with all this data. I think Major League Baseball has hired three or four people just to figure out what to do with the data. They have it, and, and they're working with it. I know in um, soccer, uh, there's, there's a number of teams using tracking software, tracking the players themselves. Uh, there was a company called StatDNA that I did a little work with, uh, tracking soccer balls, where it was kicked. Uh, what led to goal scoring and things like that. A good uh, a colleague of mine, Bill Gerard, uh, there in uh, I believe he's at Manchester. Uh, he does a lot of work with uh, rugby and soccer consulting, and largely what he's doing is working with some of this uh, analytics data for those teams. So it's certainly spreading around, and I think the TrackMan type software is going to be something used in other sports as well. It's it's largely a resources issue. Can you afford it? The systems aren't cheap. So When you worked in the University of Michigan, you worked with the Department of Kinesiology. Mm -hmm. How important or how exciting is this area of economics when it's mixed or blended in with other disciplines, with the human body and so on? So you, you must be very excited for this because I know you worked with Rodney Fort and perhaps Stefan Szymanski as well, and I had them on the show too. Um, fantastic being able to talk about sports from this perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really exciting to to blend these sorts of things. So we have, I'm in, I'm in a, a strange school here at Florida. It's called Health and Human Performance. So we have kinesiology, and then we have health education behavior, and we actually have tourism and sport management in my department. So we have a, a tourism guy downstairs uh, that I've been talking to, he works a lot with tracking tourists and how they walk through cities. So he's worked with this sort of tracking data before. Uh, he measures heart rate. Uh, he's worked with some kinesiologists, and they measure heart rate and understand when people are getting excited as they're walking through the cities. Uh, and I think there's there's clear collaboration that could happen in the sports realm uh, that would be really exciting. Uh, my hope is that sometime we can work with the sports teams here on looking at tracking data, looking at well, how do we maximize their stamina in, say, a soccer game? 
uh, if we're watching them run this much, are they being efficient with with where they're running to and how they're playing the game? And I think I think we would need somebody that understands human body movement. There's technology for baseball. There's a sleeve that can evaluate uh, the torque and things like that on the arm uh, when a ball is thrown. Uh, I wouldn't know where to start with that, but certainly we can think about where we could collaborate with understanding the game, understanding how it's played, understanding how that leads to uh, higher or lower salaries in the game and going back to the kinesiologist and saying, okay, how can we change this or how can we improve this? So yeah, I'm really excited at that. Um, but I, I think it's a huge collaboration. We're actually talking about it right now in my department uh, with a guy down in tourism, Dan Fessemeyer. I think you need to get engineers and physicists involved uh, in terms of the measurement portion. And then once you have the measurement portion down, then we can get into the fun part, the economics of why these things matter and how they matter in the context of the game or the, the labor market and the interaction of teams. And I say you're so lucky to have the, the diversity under one department as well, to be able to collaborate like that. And you said we have to get the engineers involved, but I'm sure the architects want to get involved as well, because if the tourist heart rate goes up and they're touring around the city, they want to know the focal point of what gets them exciting and retail too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think all of this sort of tracking software, people are just starting to understand it and understand how to use it. And I think once, like I said, once we understand how to measure these things, I think the economists can come in and, and understand, well, how does it lead to uh, certain types of, of behavior? How does it impact the economy? So if we can maximize uh, the amount of money that people spend when they're a tourist because they're walking a certain way throughout the city. Uh, certainly travel and tourism economists are going to be all over that. Brian, I'd love to ask one more question. Sure. I'd love to find out a recommended book that you have read. I know you have plenty there behind you. Uh, for anything in particular or just generally? I, I, I love the general stuff as well. I love the general stuff. So so you mentioned the Data Camp course. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, exploring pitch data or exploring baseball data with R by Max Marchi and Jim Albert. Uh, Jim Albert and I worked together on a blog uh, a little bit, and um, we're talking about possibly doing another data camp course uh, together. And one of the books that really made me start to understand about what sports economics is all about, why it exists in the first place, it's all about antitrust, uh, is Pay Dirt by Rodney Fort and Jim Quirk. And while the while the book is, the data in it is, is pretty old, it's, it's relatively outdated, I think it gives such an excellent scope of why sports economics exists in the first place, uh, largely from the people that, that made it exist. So I think leaving aside the fact that the data is relatively old, the same lessons stand and it's, it's written at a, at a level that uh, is accessible to a lot of people. Brian, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you. Share again with our listeners where they can find you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can find me uh, online at brianmmills.com or at Twitter at B-M-M-I-L-L-S-Y. You can find all the links to Brian at economicrockstar.com forward slash Brian Mills. Brian, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are an economic rock star. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.